This is Ham Radio Now, episode 275. Mars attacks. Yeah, okay, that's clickbait. You guys agree that's clickbait? Yep. <laughs> All right, here, I'm Gary Pierce, KN4AQ, here on my screen. On your left is co-host for the MCOM Extra, and this is MCOM Extra number three, is uh, David Goldenberg, W0DHG. Welcome back, David. Good morning, Gary. We had a good, long conversation yesterday just on Facebook, so if you've missed this on the YouTube, you got to go back to Facebook, just kind of getting ready for this, and, and mostly because I screwed up the date for the event, so sorry about that. Uh, in the middle is Paul English. <clears throat> Paul, you are WD8DBY, and um, your eight is uh, misleading because you're in Texas. You're the Army Mars Program Manager. Is that, have I got your title correct? Stolen out of that, That's correct. Okay. And uh, it, I decided to keep my eight call sign because uh, my family, we have sequential call signs, WD8, DBX, Y, and Z. Ah. And so that's that's why we kept those. The, the number doesn't really mean anything anymore. But, you know, I've, I've been around for a while. You've been around for a while based on that call. <clears throat> in, in the olden days, if you moved from to a different call zone, you had to change your call sign. Mm -hmm. if, yeah, first license back in uh, 1976. Okay, cool. So uh, the reason we are all here is this um, bulletin that the ARRL published a while ago, the Mars Amateur Radio Interoperability Exercise to Test a Very Bad Day Scenario. And it will start tonight, tonight from the perspective of recording this, which is uh, Sunday, October 30th. Its official time is um, 0300 UTC, October 31st, but that works out to 11 p.m. Eastern time here. Um, and uh, it's going to be a very, very bad day. Uh, what, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean by that? So, so uh, Mars Military Auxiliary Radio System is a group of amateur radio volunteers who have volunteered their time and services to support either the Army or Air Force programs. And the purpose of Mars is really to provide contingency communication support to the Department of Defense. So we go through uh, rigorous training uh, with our members, and then on a quarterly basis, uh, we do this quarterly communications exercise uh, where we're actually supporting the DOD headquarters um, in a very bad day scenario. So the purpose of these exercises is really to test how we're doing uh, on our techniques, tactics, and procedures in our ability to support uh, the, the supported uh, DOD headquarters. Uh, so for this exercise, we are simulating that there has been a nationwide, widespread uh, communications outage. Uh, now, we understand that uh, the likelihood of losing all communications simultaneously throughout the, the United States uh, is very unlikely to happen. But in order to do training, uh, that's what we simulate, that uh, traditional forms of communication are gone and the uh, Department of Defense the headquarters that we support has activated the Mars program because of this notional disaster and asked us to provide that contingency communication support. Uh, so, so that's what we mean by a very bad day. Uh, this is something that would be worse than a hurricane, Rita, Katrina, Sandy, Matthew, et cetera. Uh, something far more widespread uh, impacting a larger portion of the U.S. Uh, so that's where the, the term very bad day comes from. Yeah, and uh, you don't train for minimum level things. You need to sort of train for maximum level things. So I guess that's that's reasonable. David, when you do training out, out west there, you guys go for worst case scenarios, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. You know, our assumptions are when we do drills is that um, repeaters are – they're there as backup, but we're not going to be using them. We're mostly <laughs> training on simplex and, and what we can cover. And uh, we'll put everybody, deploy everybody out in LA, it's hospitals, to the hospitals that, that we'll, we have in support. And, and again, the assumption, just, just as Paul said, the assumption is that we're not going to lose all of them at all at the same time, but it'll be a coordination around, okay, these two are out and how do we you know move people to the other hospitals and coordinate the communications around that. Yeah. So, Paul, let's, uh, let's get some details. How is this um, actually going to go off? What, what starts at 11 o'clock tonight? 
Well, it, it actually starts uh, at 1800 Zulu, uh, which is uh, about two minutes from now. Uh, oh, what's going to happen then? Uh, we're doing what we call a soft start. Uh, the way we train and the way we think this thing will happen is Mars members, amateur radio members in their local area are going to start noticing things. Uh, if you're sitting there, it's a Sunday afternoon and you're watching uh, the NFL football game and you start losing the picture if you're on satellite or you know you, the power starts going funky or you're trying to make a phone call or you're on the internet and things just aren't working right and that goes on for some period of time and, and you're thinking hmm something's not right and so what we ask our members to do is to self-activate their state and region hf nets and just come online and start talking uh, to other folks who we anticipate would also be experiencing the same sort of effects and from that, we're we're activating the network essentially from the bottom up. It's the local Mars members that are noticing something's not right, and, and that's going on for a period of time. Um, so we call that a, a soft start. It's sort of a self-awareness that something out of the ordinary may be going on. And so you'll we'll have members start activating HF nets coming up on the air, talking to other Mars members, trying to gain situational awareness about what's going on. Once they understand now that's going to that, that's going to happen on um, Mars frequencies, not on ham radio frequencies. That, that's correct. That'll start out on Mars frequencies, uh, which I, which I believe are not fully disclosed. And we can find some of them, but but they're not they're not all out there for everybody to find. That's correct. Uh, we have them categorized as for official use only, which means that we are not allowed to post them or talk about them. Uh, all of the, uh, the the government frequencies we operate are outside of the ham bands. Okay, so go so, ahead. So it, as we're gaining situational awareness at the local level, our leadership at the state and region levels will start putting together uh, communication spot reports, and we'll start sending those out to Fort Huachuca. Uh, where headquarters uh, Army Mars is located, and we'll start submitting this information that, hey, there's something going on. Um, we anticipate then that other sources at the DOD level, Department of Defense, will start realizing something's going on. And an hour or two hours into the exercise, we should start seeing activity from the supported headquarters uh, where they will start sending message traffic saying, hey, something's happening. We need to, on a full scale, activate the Mars network. And then they will start sending out messages, uh, what we call requests for information uh, that our Mars members will act upon. How do, these, how do these messages go out? What is it voice? Is it um, data? Is it on the air? Is it on the Internet? Uh, no, uh, all of our activity is done over the air on HF, and those messages will go out as a digital form. Uh, we use a military standard uh, communications form, and, and that's how it will uh, be uh, uh, run throughout the uh, HF networks. Are your members pretty much monitoring their data network all the time? Is this something that gets spit out pretty much well, instantly we, to them? We, we have a, a couple of different modes. Uh, we have a, a an ALE, Automatic Link Establishment, uh, messaging system out at Fort Huachuca where those messages can be put on the ALE network and broadcast automatically on the ALE networks um, at a specified period. Right now we do a six-hour broadcast, but that can be upped uh, to as often as we need to start getting the word out. Uh, and we have members who have ALE stations uh, throughout the, uh, the U.S., and they will start receiving those broadcasts, uh, decoding those messages, and then start acting on those. Uh, for this entire exercise, we do it radio only, uh, HF, uh, VHF. Uh, we do allow our members to use repeaters as long as they are non-internet linked, uh, no ILRP, no echo link, et cetera. <laughs> as long as they are radio to radio linked, that's fine. Uh, so everything that we do is strictly radio only. Now, you, you asked the question about monitoring uh, the broadcast. So we have the ALE broadcast. And then we also, uh, unlike on the amateur bands, on our frequencies, we're allowed to, to simultaneously run voice and data. So we'll do all of our net coordination via voice. And then when we have messages to send, we'll automatically uh, send those on the same channel. Or if there's a lot of traffic, uh, we'll move folks off to a working channel uh, just so we keep the main calling channel free. 
Do you have lots of uh, lots of spectrum available to you? Um, multiple channels uh, we, in the, on the same same bands, basically. Yes, we do. Uh, we we have uh, quite a number of frequencies, you know, in all band ranges, so that we have uh, frequencies for any time of the day uh, to account for propagation factors. Yeah, and are these pretty much exclusive for your use? Or do you have to compete with anybody for their use? Uh, all of the frequencies we use uh, are approved by the Department of Defense and coordinated through uh, NTIA. Uh, some of the channels that we use are shared uh, spectrum, and some of them are dedicated for us. All right. And, but you don't have to compete with someone kind of squeezing in from the top or the, a little above or a little below like we do on the hand bands. Uh, we do, actually. Uh, oh. <laughs> some, of our, some of our channels are in the, uh, the AM broadcast band. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so we, we will have competition from some of those AM broadcasters, et, et cetera. Uh, some of the other federal services uh, may be, you know, uh, pretty close to us. And depending on how clean their signal is, how clean our signals are, you know, there, there may be some crosstalk there. So, yeah, just like on the hand bands, we, we have to uh, to compete with Spectrum as well. OK. Yeah. I've, I've been saying um, for a long time that the reason – like our North Carolina areas group uses Mars frequencies is because they don't have anybody encroaching on the edges. I'm going to have to stop saying that. I guess I was making an invalid assumption. <laughs> Darn. Roger. <laughs> All right. So uh, those are the messages. I guess uh, it's uh, two Oh five right now. The messages have, have started. At least people are, are sort of self um, announcing. They got your, your members got the word that, I guess they make up their own little individual scenario and then they start sending something out. Yeah. What, what they'll do is uh, it's a notional activity that something has happened when they, when they uh, come up on the frequency, you know, they'll, they'll give a report that says, you know, what's going on. Uh, in some cases, everything may be fine. In other cases, you know, somebody uh, may actually be using backup power, you know, just to test their generators. And so they would report that. Uh, now, when it comes to the information that we'll be uh, asking from the amateur radio community, uh, we are asking the amateur radio operators to report absolutely real world. So if everything is functional, that's what we're asking them to report. And that is what begins today at um, 11 p.m. with a broadcast of some sort coming from. Yeah, so, so the broadcast we're doing is, is something new. Uh, we've been toying around with this idea for about a year. Uh, we are looking for a means where we can have a single source uh, available to do informational broadcasts uh, to not only Mars members, but also to amateur radio operators uh, following a, a very bad day. You know, a very bad day has happened. Where can you go to find out information about what's going on or where assistance may be needed? And so... Uh, uh, really, last year is when the 60-meter channels came into their own. Uh, the power of 60-meter channels is the Mars community, we now have joint authorizations to use those frequencies once we coordinate that effort with, uh, with the FEMA spectrum managers. And the power is that the amateur radio operators have secondary use of those frequencies. So unlike Armed Forces Day, which happens every May, where – We'll be transmitting on on uh, Mars frequencies and listening on amateur radio frequencies to communicate on 60 meters. The Mars stations, other government stations, and the amateur radio operators can be on the same channel uh, talking to one another. So it, it really eliminates uh, you know having to do the crossband piece. So so that's really what we're trying to promote. So as we explored this idea. Uh, we enlisted uh, the assistance of a military unit uh, on the East Coast, and we have our Fort Huachuca HF gateway uh, out towards the West Coast. And on 60 meters, our spectrum authorizations allow us to run up to uh, three kilowatts, <laughs> whereas the amateur radio operators are only authorized 100 watts. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask about that. So you're anticipating mm -hmm. just about all my questions here. Ah, okay. Um, but but um, let, let, let's go into the 60-meter thing a little bit more because I've always been um, interested and curious. It was um, a little over a decade ago, I guess, uh, sometime in the 90s, that we uh, we got our initial allocation of 60-meter channels. I was on on day one. Um, and I didn't do the research to remember what exactly day, day that was. 
the excuse, um, the 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 logic that we presented to NTIA for spectrum there was that in the daytime, 80 meters can get too short, mm -hmm. 40 meters can get too long. And we're talking about distances on, on 80 meters, it would stop at about 100, 150 miles or so. When, for example, North Carolina is over 300 miles wide, we couldn't cover the whole state on 80. But 40 would be just a little bit too far and there'd be some big skip zones. So the sweet spot would be then five megahertz, 60 meters, we could use some spectrum there. That's what we said we wanted. That's not what we've done. Um, we have not, for the most part, utilized 60, especially in the daytime. Um, and we use it as typical hams at night for rag chewing and DX and stuff like that. So I don't think we've followed through on the thing we said we needed 60 meters for. And that's why this activity particularly caught my eye because you're going to be using 60 meters. So um, how, how does that work from your end of things? Yeah, it, it falls right into the original purpose. And, and we've been coordinating this effort with uh, Mike Corey at ARRL. Um, there is a, a great interest, just like uh, 5367, is the Alaska Emergency Channel. Uh, there is a lot of interest in having a similar 60 meter channel or set of channels uh, established for the Pacific area, for the continental United States, for the Caribbean Atlantic area. And so we see this effort is, is really promoting uh, the use of 60 meters for that emergency type of operation. Uh, and, and like I said, you know, that the 60 meter high power broadcast, what we're trying to do is generate interest in 60 meters because uh, right now it's not really that popular. We A lot of amateur radio operators don't have antennas cut for it. So, you know, by doing a high power broadcast, um, you know, anything, you know, a piece of wire hanging in the air, you should be able to receive it. You know, you don't need to be cut for it. And, you know, we wanted to test the power of this thing by sending out an informational broadcast. And as part of that broadcast, we will ask amateur radio operators, shortwave listeners, et cetera, uh, to submit a reception report uh, to tell us how we did. And what I want to do is as we receive those reception reports, my plan is to plot those on a Google Earth map and then publish that following the exercise that shows how we did from both the East Coast Station and the West Coast Station. How will you receive the reception reports? Is that just by someone talking directly to you on the frequency or do you get them by email? Do you have a website? Yeah, uh, the instructions will, will be in the actual voice broadcast. It'll, it'll be a website uh, that we will ask folks to go to. And uh, uh, there's just a few simple questions on there about uh, you know a standard reception report. Excuse me just a second. I've got an ALE <laughs> broadcast coming in. Oh, cool. Turn uh, it up. Can we hear it? Uh, it, it'll be, it'll just sound like a bunch of, Oh, it's data. It's just all data, right? Yeah. Can you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. Which is, yeah, that's the, uh, the military standard, the Mike 110 broadcast that's coming in. It is part of the exercise. I have no idea what that is. Uh, it's a mill standard 188, 110 alpha is the official name. Um, uh, it's a serial phase shift king, uh, form of modulation, uh, that the military uses and that we have, uh, compatibility with. Okay, so it's not Pactor, it's not not anything that hams have been using. Are we authorized to use that, or is it proprietary? Uh, it, it is not proprietary, uh, but because of the bandwidth, uh, you're not allowed to use that on amateur radio frequencies because it exceeds the the symbol rate uh, that's authorized on the ham yeah. bands. Okay, so there's there's stuff at the FCC about that now. <laughs> may, yes, may yeah. change things. Now, for the last two years on Armed Forces Day, we've actually publicized uh, where you can download uh, this MIC 110 program. And we had some of the uh, Armed Forces Day stations sending the, uh, the uh, Secretary of Defense message in the MIC 110 uh, format. Yeah, uh, so so we, can't, yeah. we can't transmit it, but we can receive it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, a, a straightforward broadcast. There's no ARQ mode, so yeah, no problem in receiving it. All right. Um, David and I were talking about 60 meters on a little Facebook exchange um, last night. I guess one of the one of the issues with hams getting on 60 meters continues to be my radio doesn't do 60 meters. 
that's a radio yeah. that's like 30 years old, but it still yeah. seems to be the big excuse. That's right. And, you know, I, I, when this came up the other day, I thought, okay, I'm not sure I can do 60 <laughs> meters. I have an antenna that I'll cover it, but I went out to the garage to look and both of my older HF radios, uh, they don't cover 60 meters at all. Um, so, and I wonder how many we're going to leave out by, by being on those frequencies. So but, I know you said that, um, this was going to be kind of a spontaneous test. Um, do you have an idea of how many people you're anticipating to show up for that from, from at least from your organization? Uh, typically for these exercises, we will range upwards of about 400, uh, Mars stations that participate during a, a quarterly exercise. That's great. All right. So, um, David was talking about, uh, last night about how, um, it's, uh, 60 meters for his area is not that big a deal because he's covering a county. Mm -hmm. Although you got a mountain range in the middle of your county, right? Yeah, a couple of them. And your VHF doesn't get across it. No, we just put people at the top of the mountains to <laughs> cover yeah. that. But, you know, at a 60 meter, because I've, I've read about um, some some public service events, bike tours and stuff, that have valleys and mountains between them, and they'll use NVIS um, on 80 or 60 to to get through. You know, people tend to think these bands are dead during the daytime, and they're not dead. They have wider coverage than the widest coverage individual mountaintop repeater you can think of from your little station, you know, sitting here at home. Um, they're great, and but not very. But no, you know, nobody uses them in the daytime because they think I, I can't work Europe. What good is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and again, we're we're approaching this from an interoperability standpoint, from a emergency type of scenario. And, and that's that's really where we're trying to approach this is to, to promote the use of 60 meters for those purposes. Uh, this past summer, I, I got to participate in a NORTHCOM sponsored exercise where we had some uh, Air Force uh, Reserve uh, comms units uh, on the air and uh, they fired up their HF gear and we were specifically doing some work on 60 meters. And it just so happens that uh, one of the mornings we fired up uh, the radio, uh, there were some amateur radio operators on the 60-meter channel just talking away. Uh, they, they held a, a regular uh, uh, session every morning on that frequency, and I jumped in with my government call sign and explained to them that <laughs> we were doing a communications exercise with some Air Force personnel and just asked if they would uh, like to help us out uh, doing some uh, voice message traffic. And it was it was interesting. They they came back and said, "Well, we've never done that before, but <laughs> sure, sounds like fun. We're, we're in." The, were they a little bit con concerned that am I, am I allowed to do this? Can I talk to you if you don't have a ham call sign? No, no, there was no concern at all. At all, they were more concerned that they had never done anything like that before, and so they they were just a little unsure of what we were asking. But I walked them through it, and and they they were happy to do it. And after we uh, signed off, I, I listened on, on the radio for a little bit longer, and uh, it was funny listening to them. They were all excited. They said, hey, that was pretty neat. We've never done that before, but hey, you know, that was fun. Yeah, that was pretty cool. There, there's, um, at least down here in the southeast, there's a bunch of guys who use it in the morning until um, the, the band dies to the point where it doesn't do 400 miles anymore. You know, it goes down mm -hmm. to 200 miles or so. Or they, you know, most of them seem retired. I don't think they're going to work, but they're go off and do other stuff. But that's when I hear the activity. But after about 10 o'clock in the morning, it's a ghost town. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess what, what I'm hearing is you agree. It's time to get 60 meters going again or yeah, going and, and, for the first time. Yeah, and absolutely. And, you know, it really comes down to the point of, you know, the, the old adage, use it or lose it. And so we are really trying to promote the interoperability piece for emergency coordination. Uh, between government and amateur radio operators. Yeah. Uh, that's really Although you are, where we you are starting at 11 p.m. tonight when the band will be wide open. <laughs> yeah, and, and we did that um, on purpose. Uh, when we did the VOACAP uh, uh, propagation analysis, we were going for as much coverage as we could get. Again, uh, going for as much widespread promotion as we could get. And, you know, when we did the VOACAP coverage, uh, like I said, the East Coast station, they'll be running our max authorized at 3KW. Uh, we have uh, almost the entire continental U.S. at about 85 to 90 percent coverage. Uh, we're up into Alaska at about uh, 70 percent. 
Uh, we're over into Western Europe at about uh, 70 to 80 percent coverage. Uh, and, and that's what we were going for, you know, to, to, to maximize the amount of coverage, to maximize the, the number of amateur radio operators who should be able to receive the broadcast. And it's just going to be from those two um, coastal stations, uh, no stations in the, in the center of the country. Uh, that's correct. Uh, we, we had the resource on the East Coast. We had the, the resource on the West Coast. Uh, we didn't have anything lined up uh, in the middle of the country. You know, that's certainly something we could look at in the future. But, you know, proof of concept. And, uh, you know, we'll see how this goes the first go around and then develop the concept from there. All right. What goes on from there? It starts at 11 for, I guess, for an hour. They're going to ping pong back and forth between East and mm -hmm. West. or, mm -hmm. And then what happens after that? Um, that'll end the uh, the broadcast piece of it, and after that, uh, our Mars operators should have the request for information, um, asking them to uh, to go out and start contacting amateur radio operators, and start uh, you know finding out what's going on ac across the U.S. Uh, at at the county level, All right, and, so and that will really take uh, take up the rest of the exercise, is to give our folks plenty of time to reach out to the amateur radio community on those established VHF and UHF repeaters, on those established nets, and just soliciting that type of information. All right. So it's going to quiet down on 60 at that point. Or, or is it, will there be overnight activity continuing on 60? Yeah. It, the, the 60 meters will really be individual Mars operators in each of the states and regions uh, monitoring those 60-meter channels. So if uh, amateur radio operators are on there, you know, maybe they could break into the QSO and, and ask for assistance. Or if, am or if amateur radio operators want to participate, uh, we are going to try to have Mars uh, volunteers monitoring those 60-meter channels so that if an amateur radio operator wanted to call any Mars station on uh, 60 meters, uh, we're hoping that uh, we will have enough folks on there to, uh, to cover down and be able to respond to them. All right. Well, I mean, it's just five channels, so it should be should be plenty of plenty easy to find somebody. Um, but then it's also going to migrate to VHF. Well, let me, let me ask the timing question first, because the middle of the night is going to get quiet. Although it's mm -hmm. middle of the night here out where you are, David, it's still the shank of the evening. Right. So, you know, that, that may be where things start tending to get busy first. And then it continues on, on Monday, all day Monday, and then wrapping yeah. up when? Yeah, all day Monday, and then it'll wrap up uh, Tuesday uh, around noontime. Um, again, we're trying to give our, our operators maximum time to reach out into the amateur radio community using those already existing VHF and UHF repeaters, uh, using nets that uh, you know that are already established nets, checking into those nets and uh, asking for assistance in providing that information. So can I ask about that? So... When you say established nets, those are established um, Mars nets or other established nets that the Mars operators are aware of? Um, that's the part I, I don't quite understand. Yeah, there are no Mars nets that I know of. Right. Uh, no, it, this is for the Mars members to reach out to the amateur radio community. Okay. What we ask our Mars members to do is to be active in the amateur radio community. And so... You know, they know what Mars or, or I'm sorry, what amateur radio repeaters are in their area. Uh, they should know when those nets, those amateur radio nets are held on those repeaters. We're asking them to reach out to the amateur radio community on those existing amateur radio frequencies on those repeaters and to join in on those existing nets. So, so for, we, we are joining the amateur radio nets. So, for instance, so um, Monday night, my uh, Aries organization runs a a net at, uh, nine o'clock. The, mm -hmm. I guess the idea would be that maybe one of my members is, is involved with Mars, whether I know it or not, or there's a Mars, um, member in the area and they'll jump on and check into that net and ask for whatever information is you guys are asking for. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Uh, to join those already established amateur radio nets and, uh, Really, what we're asking for is state and county of where you're located and then just a, a general situation. Are the lights on? Uh, is the water running? You know, what's the traffic situation? You know, just basic questions like that uh, that our Mars members will then format and code and, and send to hire uh, to answer those requests for information. You missed our interesting answers by about a week here on the East Coast. 
we we yeah. could we could have given, given you some more. That's yeah. the sky is yeah. not blue out here. <laughs> well, when we did the uh, quarterly exercise this past August, I was checked into a net, and uh, you know there were several folks on there, and there was some interesting weather uh, going through their area, and you know they reported that they had been without power, you know that uh, areas were flooded, um, all of that was real world. Uh, nothing being made up. And I forget the name of the storm that had just gone through, but it caused a, a lot of flooding in the area. And so that's what they reported. Yeah. Um, other folks, you know, sun was shining, lights were on, everything's good. Uh, this is not your first rodeo. You do these things, um, in, I guess you're saying quarterly, but we just don't hear yes. very much about them. And I, I've seen announcements. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to jump on one. Before it actually happens, although only slightly, because, you know, I emailed you yesterday or the day before, and this announcement <laughs> went out a couple of weeks ago. I've been busy. Um, Life got in the way. Yeah, but, but David, you haven't heard diddly from your Mars guys. They're there. They're just kind of undercover. Yeah, you know, I know I know a couple of Mars guys. Um, Jim's more in Ventura County. And I'm really um, having a hard time not saying Martians and saying Mars guys. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't heard anything about it. And, you know, I'll make sure when, when we hold our net tomorrow night, um, gosh, I hope I'm home from trick or treating with my kids, but I'll make sure that, uh, that, uh, you know, I'll put out traffic and, and ask if anybody's in there hiding in the woodworks to definitely, you know, give their report. And I know there'll be an earlier, we have an interop net for, uh, Northern Los Angeles and Ventura County. And if some of those guys are probably involved with Mars, so I, I hope that they'll be there as well. But other than that, I haven't I haven't heard anything about the coordination or anything um, about this test. And same same as the last time when they did the, the Armed Forces Day, I think I heard about it that day or the day before. Kind of stumbled across it and thought, oh, well, can I get in there? Can I hear? Can I make it work? But you know, again, sixty meters isn't really working for me. Someday. Yeah. So, Paul, you're you're definitely trying to reach out harder this time than in previous exercises. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a work in progress, and you know we, we are continuing to ask our members to promote this at the local level. You know, reach out to the amateur radio clubs in the area, talk about what we do, talk about the fact that uh, we are trying to strengthen the partnership uh, between the Mars community and the amateur radio community, uh, trying to make sure that uh, we don't come across as you know we are Mars, we're here to save the day, you know. Uh, <laughs> Superman. Step out of our way. Uh, it's definitely a partnership. And the meetings I've had with Mike Corey, you know, we all agree. If a very bad day scenario were to happen for real, there will be more than enough contingency communications work required, assistance needed across the board, that no one organization can do it by themselves. It has to be a partnership. And you, you can only build that partnership uh, through practice and through training. And, and that's what we're trying to do here. That super bad day, that may never come. But bad days on a more limited uh, scale will certainly come mm -hmm. frequently. We, we, just, we have yeah, them all it, the time. So this, this scales I, I down. I have a perfect example of that. Um, Hurricane Matthew, uh, first week of October, um, was coming up through the Caribbean. Uh, we were alerted by the Department of Defense around the 3rd or 4th of October that, hey, uh, Matthew's track is headed to Haiti, and we need you to activate Mars stations and listen on the Amateur Radio Emergency Center of Activity frequencies. Uh, we knew that the Hurricane WatchNet had activated, I think, somewhere around the 1st of October. So when we activated on the 4th, our Mars uh, volunteer region director in Region 4 reached out to uh, Bobby Graves from the Hurricane WatchNet. My Region 4 guy introduced himself, explained what was going on, why our interest in the Hurricane WatchNet, and we really created a partnership there. We didn't activate any Mars HF nets. We asked our Mars operators to join the existing amateur radio nets. So we had folks monitoring Hurricane WatchNet, the maritime mobile net, and the Saturn nets, just listening for information that would be of interest to, to the Department of, of Defense. Uh, Bobby Graves uh, was able to contact amateur radio operators on the island of Haiti and got some pertinent information 
pushed it to us, and we posted it to a portal that was being used by the U.S. Southern Command, who is responsible for that AOR, that area of responsibility. Within two hours of us publishing that information, we were contacted by a a member of the 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit saying, hey, great information. Here's some other questions that we have. Can you help us with that? So we sent that back out to the Hurricane WatchNet, and we ended up publishing either two or three more informational bulletins to that website. And we received uh, queries from U.S. Southern Command, as well as uh, a Netherlands uh, disaster response team looking for additional type of information. So, again, we didn't activate a single HF net. We partnered with the amateur radio community and was able to provide useful and timely information to assist those units who were responding to that humanitarian disaster. To me, that's a win-win partnership. Interesting, because we don't very often get to hear the um, the actual results, the communications that, that goes on. And so it's mm-hmm. good to get some specifics. One thing that caught my attention is how long it took. Uh, it, it, it was hours from pinging back and forth these pieces of information. It was not instantaneous, but stuff yeah, still got it, filled in. Yeah, and, and again, our information is posted to a web portal, and it just depends on how many people are looking at that portal and when they come in and look at it. You know, so that 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 accounts for some of the time lag. And but at, at the end of the day, the information that was provided was relevant and useful. And we were able to do that through the partnership with uh, the amateur radio operators. So to me, win win. Now, did the um, when when you posted the uh, the stuff that you were hearing and somebody saw it, were they going? This came from who now? Or did they know um, who you were? No, there was no questions like that. Um, it was more of, hey, this is useful information. What else can you provide for us? Uh, we've been practicing these types of scenarios for about three years now. Um, if you remember the uh, Nepal, uh, Kathmandu, Nepal earthquake that happened in April of 2015, yeah. uh, Mars members and amateur radio operators from uh, Kathmandu participated in the response to that to that earthquake. And we had trained for that exact scenario in the two previous years uh, during a exercise called Pacific Endeavor. Uh, so we are out there promoting our, you know, what it is that we can bring to the table. And so when we started posting information from Hurricane Matthew, I think there was some semblance of knowing who we were and how this information was was uh, being provided. So back to the VHF nets that are about mm-hmm. to uh, about to get some activity. Uh, do you have any idea how much of the country is actually going to get covered with that? Um, at this point, I, I really don't. Um, if you think about the the scenario where a very bad day has happened, it's a really come as you are. Uh, who's available at the time? Um, because depending on what's going on in any particular part of the country, in a disaster scenario, you want people to take care of themselves and their families first. Make sure that they are good to go, that the family is set up and able to provide for themselves before you start volunteering. And so depending on what's going on, that may limit uh, the number of operators who are actually available and therefore you know, what coverage we can expect to achieve across the U.S. Part of the uh, Part of our training objective for this exercise is we don't want Mars members to stay up and on the air for the entire duration of the exercise. That's not realistic. Um, You will have to sleep. You have to eat. You have things that you have to take care of around the the household. And so we're not expecting folks to be up there all the time. Although our conversation, we did a show with some of the folks from Matthew, and yes, some of those guys are up for almost the whole thing for days on end. So it can yeah. happen, but you yeah, don't it, want it, it to. Can, yeah, it, it can happen. And that's a testament to the fact that those guys had done all their preparation and were good to go. Um, it, it's going to depend on the severity of the situation, the severity of the situation where you are and your ability to to be on the air. So going into this, you know, we, we don't have a good idea of what the coverage is going to look like. That comes in the after action review of when we start plotting who is actually available on the air, 
what was our coverage out to the amateur radio community? What sort of coverage did we get from the 60 meter broadcast? All of that will get plotted and analyzed to show how we did in this one scenario. This so when you, when you send out this message at uh, 8 o'clock my time or – yeah, I think it's 8 o'clock my time. Um, it's going out on 60 meters. So for the average um, Mars station, they've got to be there listening to it or, or are you send, you're she's sending out voice I assume. Um, mm-hmm. Is there also data that you're sending out to their data stations that are on the Mars frequency? So they may have a logged – in case they don't happen to be next to their radio at the time you know, in a more real world scenario Mm -hmm. Um, or do you have to be like sitting there waiting to get the message at the time? So two parts to that question for the 60 meter broadcast, it is voice only and each station will be rebroadcasting, retransmitting that um, every 10 minutes for that hour. Excuse me. Um, The East coast station will start at the top of the hour Five minutes after the top of the hour is when the West Coast station will will, uh, broadcast, and then they space it out every 10 minutes. So if you weren't able to receive the voice broadcast during that hour from either one of those stations, um, that's it. You know, there's no rebroadcast, et cetera. So you have to be physically sitting there listening for the broadcast um, unless you have a tape recorder or something else, uh, you know, digital recorder uh, where you're you're, you're, – recording whatever goes on yeah tape recorder i can tell you're old Uh, yeah i I caught myself too late that's why i reverted to digital (laughs) thanks for uh, highlighting that yeah no problem that's that's what i'm here for (laughs) now on the um you know so that's for the general amateur population if you're not there you're not recording uh the broadcast at the time then, then you won't get it for the mars members that ale broadcast that i mentioned uh, we have that broadcast that, that occurs every day, uh, about uh, every six hours every day. And if you have your amateur radio rig set up and you've got your computer running with that software, um, you don't have to be sitting there watching it. It will just come in automatically. Uh, the message will spit out on your computer. It gets logged to a log file. Okay. You can come in after you, uh, what we colloquially say, you know, you've been out chopping firewood or out hunting, out collecting water, you know, from the uh, the worst day. Uh, you can check your computer and see what messages that you've received. So you don't need to be sitting there uh, to receive those broadcasts. So a lot a lot like, you know, in MCOM we use, you know, WinLink or FL Digi and MBeams. You set up a station, it's sitting waiting, you come and check check and see what kind of traffic might have come in. Yes, okay. e- exactly. Okay. In, in uh, one of the things we've been talking about in ham radio is – um, our embarrassment of riches in both frequencies, spectrum available, and modes available, which is a great thing in, for the ham part of ham radio. But for the MCOM part of ham radio, it's hard to get locked down, hard to get everybody on the same page, same frequency, same mode, hard to advance. You know, we all tend to stick with the least common denominator. And I'm seeing that in the message that you're giving to hams, which is, don't worry, you don't have to use digital modes. You know, Mm -hmm. we're just going to be on sideband and your FM repeaters. Yet you guys um, are not, uh, you are, have the advantage of being more constrained and having a leadership that can say, thou shalt do this way. (laughs) We picked a digital mode and you're going to use it. Mm -hmm. We'll listen to you if you want to suggest something different. You change, you progress, but you get to say what it's going to be, and everybody has to toe that line. Yeah, so Gary, uh, tongue-in-cheek, but you're in the Army now. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Army, Navy. Sorry to cut you off, Paul, there, but. Yeah, or or the Air Force, yeah, because we do have Army and Air Force members. Yeah, so military. There's still a Navy Mars, isn't there? There's a Navy Mars? No, they Uh, killed Navy Mars, oh. right? Yeah, and Navy Mars uh, went away uh, one October of last year. They sank it. So, yeah, so it, it's just Mars. Army and Air Force now. So military auxiliary, our purpose is to provide contingency support to the Department of Defense. They are the ones who are saying this is the mil standard mode, the military standard mode that we need you to be competent at and to operate on so that we can talk to you. And and that's why uh, we stress the mil standard uh, Mike 110 Alpha, uh, because that is 100% compatible with the military. And it uh, works. It works good. Your, your experience with it is it's pretty robust. Um, it it is. 
Um, most of our members are using a volunteer produced uh, piece of software that emulates the Mic 110. And depending on how uh, astute our members are at tweaking <laughs> their radio setup, computer setup, etc., uh, you know, that will play some factor. Uh, into its reliability. Uh, we also have a number of members who have purchased hardware modems uh, that are available from commercial companies uh, that will do the, the Mic 110 mode. I'm guessing expensive. Um, about uh, comp comparable price to a Pactor modem. Oh, well, yeah, okay, so that's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I was going to ask about that, the, the, the station, what's the, you know, what does it all come to? What does it all look like? Uh, when it's all said and done to get up and running? Uh, look at a typical amateur radio setup, and that's what most of our members have. Um, the the Mic 110 program, the software program, that's a sound card program. So if you can run uh, RTTY on FL Digi or Mix W, or if you can run MT63 or Olivia, you can run the Mic 110 program, uh, either direct USB connection to the radio or sound card interface. Um, it is all that it takes. So a signal link and a, and an appropriate radio hooked up to it. That's not, yes. that's not too, uh, too hard to go for. No, and, no, and maybe not. in a couple of years, we'll be able to talk back or transmit <laughs> the mode. We can't talk back cause we can't, we can't use that frequency, but we can transmit but you the came mode. on 60 meters. Yeah. Yeah. on 60 meters. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. When, when I thought about the scenario, um, you know, I've thought about these kinds of things and, you know, what happens, you know, when it does hit the fan and, and how do you get the message out? And I know this is kind of a different mission, but I always wondered about like the NOAA radio network as being the kind of system that you'd want to push these messages out because you probably hit hit more people. And, and again, I guess that's not really your mission per se. Mm -hmm. I saw the the website for the reports. I think it's cool. You guys are sending QSL cards out. Yeah, uh, we're we're going to try to do that. Um, first time ever, uh, so we're we're looking forward to that. Uh, hopefully, that will be a little incentive uh, to uh, to tune in and, and participate and listen. What are the call uh, signs? Gary, call signs of the stations that are going to be on the air. Pardon me. What are the call signs? Uh, the East Coast station will be Alpha Alpha Mike Three, and the West Coast station will be Alpha Alpha Mike Nine. Those sound very strange uh, to the ham radio ear. <laughs> uh, distinguishing. Uh, Gary, you had a comment about uh, the frequencies that we use. Um, we have a standard published set of regional frequencies. Uh, those frequencies are published uh, with the supported headquarters, um, DOD headquarters, so that if they need to get a hold of us at the region level, uh, they have the standard list of frequencies uh, that, that our folks will be on and in, in monitoring. Um, when you have a standardized list of frequencies and a standardized list of modes uh, that you're authorized to use, that eliminates a lot of the interoperability issues of, okay, on what frequency or what channel do I find you and which mode of the plethora of amateur radio modes out there uh, are you going to use and do I have access to that? And, you know, am I proficient in that mode? So from our standpoint, by having predefined frequencies that we're using and a limited number of predefined modes uh, that we ask all members to be proficient at, that just eliminates a lot of those variables for interoperability. Okay, so we can find some of them, but you can squirrel yourselves away other places. Uh, it, 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 that's true. <laughs> and, and, and again, because Mars members are also amateur radio operators, for these county status reports, the county information, we're coming to you. And, and yeah, we're not asking you to find us. Okay. Yeah, so but, so we're, we're going to those 60 meter channels and we're going to those local VHF, UHF repeaters. Yeah, I just I did a quick uh, search and, you know, radio reference, the font of all radio knowledge is giving away your secret frequencies here at some of them anyway. This may or may not yeah, be, be accurate. Yeah, be careful how far you go down. There's a couple <laughs> trolls in there talking about oh. not sure this frequency. <laughs> okay. Hey, so for, for membership in the organization, what kind of training are you looking for um, amateur radio operators to have to participate in this? To participate in the exercise, or no, to no, just a as a as a become a Mars member. I yeah. Think. What does oh, it take okay. to What does it take to get in? Yeah. Okay, um, 
So on the Army side, we ask that if you're a technician class that you upgrade to general within one year. Uh, I believe on the Air Force side, uh, they will allow you to continue as a technician class. So just a, a slight difference there. You have to have access to an HF radio uh, that's capable of being modified to transmit uh, 2 to 30. So basically, you open it up. Uh, we're asking you to uh, follow all the rules and policies uh, for the Mars program. Uh, we want you to have an active email address uh, so that we can do coordination with you. Uh, you have to submit a monthly participation report that reflects uh, what you've done for the month. Uh, we ask that you participate uh, for a minimum of 12 hours on air per quarter uh, so that you're on HF, doing training, participating in exercises, etc. So it is. Uh, it sounds like it's pretty HF-centric. It's not a VHF thing anymore. It, it is. It, our bread and butter is HF. Uh, we do do uh, VHF. Um, in the Northeast, uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, Mars VHF repeaters that are up. Uh, we even have some of those that are RF linked uh, together to, to expand the coverage. Uh, here in Texas, uh, we have uh, repeaters in Houston, Austin, and Dallas uh, that uh, Mars members clustered around that area uh, will use for local coordination. And then on the West Coast, uh, there's several VHF repeaters out there as well. But you start, start HF. Yeah, our, our bread and butter is HF. Uh, that's what the supported headquarters asks us to do. Yeah, and I um, I caught the idea of no internet linking, no other kinds of linking, which is, you know, it's going to raise a cheer from one half of the ham radio spectrum and a groan from another half. But sure. <laughs> clearly this has been debated within within Mars as to how to go about doing this, or was it pretty unanimous? It is unanimous in that that is what our supported DOD headquarters is asking us to do. You know, for these exercises, exercise as if the worst day has happened and traditional forms of communication are not available. Um, it really makes you think and have to think through a lot of very difficult problems where you can no longer just pick up the phone or send a text message to say, hey, meet me on the air. We're establishing the net at this time. How do you do that now? How do you send a, a encrypted message from the East Coast to the West Coast? If the phones are out, there's no internet and the satellites are down. Yeah. How do you I do think, that? I think limiting the, the repeaters and the digital modes for this particular exercise based on the scenario is 100% appropriate. If it's a bad day, D-Star and the, the DMR and the digital link repeaters and IRLP, it's all reliant on infrastructure and backbone that shouldn't be there based on the scenario. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's important that you, you, that they follow through on that and that the reports you get are are true to that. What is um What do you think a good outcome, a good number of reports, a good amount of information looks like from your perspective on this being a successful uh, event? Well, the, the goal is uh, we would love to see a county report from every one of the 1,343 counties across the U.S. Uh, when we did this exercise last year, uh, we had uh, 816 counties uh, that we were able to contact uh, radio, radio to radio, person to person. So I would love to beat 816 uh, this year. Uh, just so we are showing that uh, the, the work we're putting in, the outreach that we're doing is actually paying off. I guess um, we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I, do, I, do I recall vaguely that there was at, at some point a, an announcement that there were going to be harsher, more, more tighter restrictions on radios to be used for Mars that would eliminate most ham equipment? Uh, no. Uh, our ability to use amateur radio equipment is documented in uh, what's called the NTIA Red Book. Uh, it's paragraph 7.3.9, I believe. And there's a exception in there that allows uh, amateur radio operators licensed under the Mars program, as well as uh, SHARES members, uh, DHS Shared Resources, uh, to use amateur radio uh, equipment. All right, yeah. and, and there, there's been no move to change that. So your your um, frequency tolerance restrictions, things like that, accommodate 
using ham equipment. And you probably don't want somebody on there with a Heathkit SB101. Our preference would be not, especially since he like, the- He likes the, Heathkit. I can tell he's an old Heathkit guy. <laughs> I, I've got a 101 on the floor right back here. <laughs> um, I, our preference is we want members who are able to do HF digital. And, you know, the 101, yeah, yeah, yeah you can make it do that. But, uh, you know, plus you, you have to turn the thing on, let it warm up for about 30 minutes, you know, for the tubes to get burned in and yep. warmed up, et cetera. So, yeah, uh, preferably not a 101. Plus getting it outside the hand bands would be tough. It was a hand band only radio. <laughs> same, same with your swan. Yes. Yes. Or Drake. Yes. All right. Um, so tonight, 60 meters. This is the, um, that's my call sign. Wait. There's your call sign. Yeah. Okay. Screen there we go. That's the frequency. Um, for uh, this. With, with one exception, change that to upper sideband. It is upper sideband. It is upper yeah. sideband. Yeah. You might not be getting a good signal from me. I can oh, see okay. It. Yeah. Um, but every time I, I try to tell that radio to do something different, it, uh, it reverts to lower side bin, but then I come back to the memory and it's upper. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I guess I was seeing an, an LSB. Yep. 5330.5 upper side band. Which sounds like uh, this right here. Cause I've got a horrendous noise level during the day, but that's something I live with until I take the, go through the effort of, uh, getting the power company to bang on their power lines a little bit around here. Yeah, mine is mine's about the same. Yeah. Hopefully it'll it'll quiet down tonight. Yeah. The last house I lived in, um, the HF noise level was real low. Um, it, it was S1 or below on 80 meters, 60 meters. It was great. Mm -hmm. Around here, not so good. Um, and look on your VHF repeaters. Prob well, for East Coast, you know, probably not tonight, but tomorrow. And that'll depend on the energy of the, the Mars members in your area, wherever you are. They can mm -hmm. pop up any net, any time. Are they likely to show up just randomly on a on a frequency and say, I'm the Mars guy, I'm taking reports? Or are they, is there instructions strictly to go to nets? Um, no, no blanket instructions like that. Um, last exercise, uh, a local Mars member here popped up on uh, on the local repeater and did just a blind call. And uh, there was someone monitoring, came back to them, and they they collected the information. You know, so it, it's whatever the Mars member is comfortable with. You know, if you hear activity on there, you've got time. Uh, hopefully, they're going to jump in. Uh, hopefully, they're going to uh, jump in on those established nets as well. All right. I was going to say on the Internet thing, uh, all the hams and MCOM say, yeah, we, we just use the Internet as a tool. Um, but we know that it could go down. It could go away from us. So we, you know, so we don't rely on it. But I don't know that that's going to be so much true when they're actually doing stuff until it disappears on them and they scramble to find their way around it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I will say, I reached you by email. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, and, and I, I'm glad you did. Uh, I'm very pr appreciative of this opportunity to join you all and, and talk about the exercise. So thank you for this opportunity and thank you for your interest. All right. Let me uh, just do a quick uh, wrap up here. Ham Radio Now is brought to you by you, you guys who help support us. Ar Arvin, sitting over my shoulder, um, sits at the bottom of the hamradionow.tv website. Uh, is glad to take your contributions. Just click on his nose. He'll send you to the uh, contribution page, which includes Patreon for a monthly contribution or PayPal for um, for an individual, uh, you know, one at a time or uh, just ordinary credit card. There's three ways to do that. So stop by there. Thank you very much for your help keeping all this stuff going. And uh, now, Paul, watch how this happens. This is really cool. Um, to, uh, tell, tell everyone who you are first. My name is Paul English. I am the Army Mars Program Manager. And I can be reached at uh, the exercise email address is mars, M-A-R-S, dot exercises at gmail.com. All right. And David? And I'm David Goldenberg, uh, W0DHG. I'm an emergency communicator with Aries LAX in the Los Angeles area. And I am Gary Pierce, KN4AQ. I am the host, editor, chief cook, and bottle washer of Ham Radio Now. And... Uh, David, Paul is not going to get this part, so it's just you and me. I'll do part one, you do part two. Over. And out.
I bet Paul would have got it. He, he might have. <laughs> he, he, actually, Paul, it probably drives you nuts to hear over and out. Because you, you do the official language, right? Yeah, R R Roger Wilco. Yeah, but I mean, over over and out <laughs> is, you know, eh, eh, eh. The, yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Bad radio procedure. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> I think that's why we do it, Gary. Right? <laughs> that's why I do it. I, I, I did it. I did it as a joke one time, or just you know, just a thing uh, back on Ham Nation. And, and because someone emailed me and said that's a bad radio procedure. You're, if you're over, it's someone's going to listen. If you're out, you're gone. And I said, okay. So that means I'm going to stop. You can talk. I won't be listening. Yeah. Over. Uh, the the other bad one uh, pro word is repeat. Yeah. Oh, don't yeah. say that. No. Don't say no. That. No. No, no, no. Because unless you want something coming your way. Yeah, re repeat is an artillery term. Means fire the same <laughs> rounds again. <Yep. laughs> well, that, I don't know. That may work. <laughs> All right, thank you, Paul. Hey, gentlemen, thank you very much. I, I appreciate this. Uh, it was easier than I thought it was going to be. Oh, uh, fun, and took longer than you thought. We've been here an hour. Wow. Sorry, I, I blathered on so long. You did not. You're perfect. Yeah, I know. I I think it's our fault. Yeah. <laughs> no, we kept asking questions. We wanted to know stuff. All right. See you guys. Thanks. All right. Take, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you much, Paul. Thank you.